right, welcome back to the Pure Playbook. I am Dr. Dustin Boston here with the athletic trainer herself, Aaron Rajiri. All right, so here we go, Dina. So happy to have you. Gra grateful that you were able to pop on with us today. Well, this is great. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> so we have a lot to cover today. Well, we're, I don't say, can't say we were going to have a lot to cover today. Yeah. We're probably going to cover a lot today. We can go so many different directions with this, but uh, I'm going to kind of let you introduce yourself. Tell us, tell us where you're at, what it is you do and, and kind of how you got there. And then we'll just kind of go from there. Sure. So hi, everybody. I'm Diney Hampson. I live in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, which is north of the US. Um, <laughs> we do get snow, but we also get a lot of sunshine. And uh, I was actually born south of the, the border in upstate New York. And what? my parents were British and Canadian. So they moved us back to Canada to the East Coast on a tiny little island in the middle of the ocean. Hmm. And that's where I grew up. And that is where I danced. And if you dance in a tiny place with no resources, <laughs> you learn what it's like to have no resources. Music to our ears. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when I left dance and uh, entered the world of science and education, I decided that physical therapy was a great place for me to land professionally. Mm -hmm. It was movement. It was science. That seemed cool. And I ended up in Toronto, which is one of the largest, maybe the largest city in Canada. So we have a lot more resources here. And yet we still have dancers and artistic athletes who are left without resources. Mm -hmm. So after working clinically for uh, more than two decades, I said enough with that. I need to have resources that people like me when I was dancing can access regardless of where they are. And interestingly, timing wise, I had just put together this sort of library of what I would call therapeutic useful exercises that mm -hmm. I could send to people anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and then COVID hit. So I had this start of a platform that existed in a world that suddenly shut down and people didn't have access to anything, yeah. which is when I got phone calls from dancers who I knew everywhere saying, uh oh, you know, can you help me with this? Can you help me with this? And all of a sudden, I was teaching classes. I am not a te class teacher, yeah. but <laughs> I am teaching classes. I was doing virtual assessments, virtual point work, virtual like things that were in my toolbox, but I never really explored them in my toolbox. Mm -hmm. And it was really a aha moment to be, wow, we really can provide resources to anybody anywhere that are smart and useful. Right. And there's this cool community out there that I can be a part of. So I guess that's me in a nutshell. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's awesome. So what is it you started? We have it here on the screen. We have a lot of people that watch watch the the podcast, but for those that maybe not aren't watching, so what what did you create from this? What's it called? So it's called Pivot Dancer. And the reason for that is my clinic in Toronto is called Pivot Sport Medicine. And the the name Pivot Sport Medicine really came out of pivoting. When you're mm -hmm. injured and you go mm -hmm. somewhere for treatment and help, you want to leave differently than you came in. And that, by definition, is a pivot. In sport, I've worked my whole career in sport, uh, and we have lots of sports that are pivoters. You know, we have a position in basketball, a position in football. You know, these are pivot. So the yeah. word pivot really resonated with me as something that was involved in sport, involved in activity, and involved in rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. So when I created this kind of online thing to help specifically dancers, uh, a pivot dancer just became the name. Yeah. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. That's very that. consistent to what, you know, we've done here. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, I started this, pre my wife and I started this practice with the kind of the same premise with vital performance and growing up in the racing world and being a huge athlete and the vitality of the body and what, you know, God doesn't make junk power made body heals the body, you know, the whole nine. And we've kept that consistent across our brand too. And so it's kind of cool that we kind of share that commonality. That's awesome. I, I love, I love when there's subliminal meaning yes. to a bigger mission. Yes. So that's super cool. Super cool. So let me back up for a second because you said you 
you lived on a small island out in the ocean. Now, me, this is gonna might sound very stereotypical, so I apologize. But when you say that, I think of Nova Scotia. Okay, you have to go further. Oh, you God. have you have to go to Newfoundland. Oh, for Newfoundland. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, so yeah. you go as far east as you can possibly go without hitting Great Britain. Got without it. Without hitting Great Britain, you're actually almost the same distance to fly to Great Britain from there as you are to fly to Toronto, where I currently live in the middle of Canada. Really? So it is absolutely a rock in the middle of the ocean. And it is a fabulous place. The people are amazing. I credit my generosity of spirit from there, my knowledge of kitchen dance parties from there, <laughs> my knowledge of Irish dance because it was settled a lot by um, people from Great Britain. So there's yeah. a lot of Irish dance. There's a lot of Scottish dance. There's a lot of music. You cannot graduate from school there without learning a musical instrument. Oh, wow. It's very important culturally. The arts are very important culturally, but they don't have the resources. Yeah. So there would be, you know, one of me professionally. There would be one of you professionally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what was your instrument? Oh, I played the clarinet and not that well. <laughs> <laughs> Enough to get by. Enough to graduate, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's awesome. I I I you know, I just enjoy meeting people who are in line with what it is we're doing. So, let's uh as you as you danced, what was your career like? What was your what was your favorite genre of dance? What was what was your career like as a dancer? So as a dancer, I was a bunhead. I loved ballet. <laughs> I'm terrible at jazz and hip hop. Uh, I love structure and rules and regimen. So ballet really suited me. I studied Chiquetti mm -hmm. syllabus. And when I reached the age of high performance and was looking at auditions and life choices, my physical facility is not fabulous for classical ballet. Mm -hmm. And I was smart enough and knew enough people along the road to think, I don't want to have this be a challenge. And I want to do something that's going to last me a long time. Right. Uh, yes. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. It's fun say you were a bunhead and not good at jazz and hip hop. That's really all I uh, did growing up. <laughs> so the, one of the, the local universities, the dance team, we, we saw a yeah. lot of the girls on, we literally have two championship banners yeah. that are hip hop and jazz. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I respect that. Yes. I took ballet at studio, like growing up. Cause you know, it's important. I understand. I always got the speech, but I was always like just getting through ballet and then going at it. Yeah. <laughs> and everything else. <laughs> Well, what I found really interesting when I started physio yeah. was that the eye that you get in dance, and I, you can speak more to the hip hop and jazz portion of this, but in ballet, I mean, everything, everything from where you place your fingers mm -hmm. to how that movement goes from your finger to spiral through your arm, to your elbow, to your shoulder, to get elongation and movement and space, that is ingrained in my body in a yep. way that I can't explain to a non-dancer. Mm -hmm. That ability to see how the anatomy is working on SOM to create movement and shapes is invaluable when I'm assessing any athlete in any sport. And when you work in sport in Canada, you you have to do hockey. Um, you have to do figure skating, curling, believe it or not, is entertaining to watch. It's very cold. Uh, and, it, you know, I was thrown into sports that I had no experience with, mm -hmm. but I was able to look at any athlete and break down their movement because I had studied dance. Yeah. So I would suggest the, the rehab allied medical professions are great ones for mm -hmm. dancers to move into because they have that piece in their body that they can use as an advantage to somebody who didn't study dance. 
Right. And they also understand like muscle activation, like the small muscles. Like you always say, yeah. you're like, if you want someone to rehab you, you want it to be an old dancer. Yeah. Yeah. I said all the time, like if you, the, some of the best, so I, I just want to clear up, I'm, I'm pretty bold and candid. So I like, I like hitting <laughs> objections and like stereotypes head on Yeah, because I think there's a lot of people that are going to be surprised. Like, wait, you have a chiropractor in an AT in a PT all talking to each other right now and smiling. Like, are you serious? <laughs> it's like, well, the dynamics of everything that we do and to, to make this, this rant short is from a dance perspective, from an AT perspective, uh, a chiropractor, a, a physical therapist. It's like, if we can all take our vision angles and perspectives and use them together, the whole world would be a better place. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's not anybody overstepping anybody, but it's how can we collaborate, which is why when she found you and we were going through um, some of your content, it's like, this gal gets it like her mission's on point. So it's like, whether, I mean, are we going to collaborate, you know, like very, very closely, like very intentionally we might, I mean, I don't know, we could probably figure that out, but mm -hmm. back to the point of, you know, yes, having someone who is a dancer who understands, like you said, all the small movements, everything it takes to do every single finger movement, toes, how to come up on the balls of your feet. Like there's so much activation involved. It's like, you know, you can have all the good look muscles you want and have that nice six pack. But if, if you know, if intra-abdominus isn't transleaks, it's like, there's so much pelvic core that people don't talk about. And it's like, yeah, having a dancer who understands how that feels, looks, needs to act. And if they're taught you know, from a PT perspective mm -hmm. or a chiro perspective and having all that anatomy and neurology background and physiology, it's like, I honestly believe like if, if dancers, if all the, if all the PTs in the world were dancers first, you'd have the best re rehabilitation <laughs> ever, honestly. Yeah, <laughs> quite possibly. And I know Aaron mentioned that you have a lot of parents who listen to your podcast. <laughs> And, and I think that navigating healthcare is really challenging for parents because they're like, who, who do I go? Like, yeah. where do I go? Do I see my chiropractor? Do I see my physio? Do I see my AT? Do I see my uh -huh. massage therapist? What is an osteopath? Like, I, I don't know what to do with my child. Mm -hmm. uh, and I understand that it's very confusing. There are a lot of players. So the way that I have chosen to work is more like a pit crew for a race car. When you she's drive, right now. <laughs> she I'm going to interrupt you because that's what I do on the weekends is I drive race cars. On the this is crazy. <laughs> I love pit crews. Continue. You've got okay. my, opinion. so, so here's my analogy, um, is when, when you have a, you are a race car driver, you have a car, you have, you cannot be a race car driver without a car. The car yeah. is your tool. It's your instrument and you require many different technicians to operate that instrument ideally in a very quick time frame because mm -hmm. when people pit it has to be fast if you lose time in the pit you lose time on the track then you lose the race so this is how I operate medically mm -hmm. I would suggest to your parents that what you actually need for your artistic athlete or dancer is you need a pit crew. Mm -hmm. You need all of the elements of physio, chiro, AT, training, massage, it, yep. maybe not in equal doses, but you need access to all of those pieces mm -hmm. because time out of the studio means time out of technique, means time out of work, means time out of competition. If you're paying, and most of the parents are the people paying for their children to participate in school and programs, that is lost finance. Yeah. The more money you have to pay Dustin and Aaron and myself, that is money on top of the tuition that you are now losing because they're not participating. Well, so there's a loss of joy of participation and the loss of finance. Yeah, so cheap. Sorry. I said, at least dance is more of an inexpensive sport, right? I said, so cheap. <laughs> uh, mm, no, not in Canada. Not um, here either. <laughs> I was being very facetious. Okay. Anyway, so that's my, my bit of a tangent, but, but really truly, that's why you need a pit crew, yeah. right? Because you need people that will look at you with their brain, their knowledge and um, be able to say, yeah, I can help you with this, this, and this. And mm -hmm. now you need to go see Dinah or you need to talk to Aaron to, to tweak those other pieces to most yeah. efficiently get you back on the track. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. We always talk about how other sports have like pitching coaches and batting coaches, but like dance in specific and not just dance, like dance, gymnastics, cheer, Mm -hmm. they don't have position coaches like that. So it's like, yes, you might need to, your coach tells you, Hey, I need you to get your turns together. Okay. Well, you might need the pit crew, all the resources Mm -hmm. to do that. And it's not just going to your pitching coach. We don't have that. That's really cool. So there's a couple of different things you said. So you've, I don't know if this is something that you have also coined or if you gave her some insight into this, but you've said artistic athletes most of the time. Is that, is, is that one of your things too, or did that is one of my things too. Uh, and I, I don't, well, I love talking about the, is a dancer, an artist or an athlete, because I'm like, well, but they're both. Mm-hmm. And one of my dancers, I will give her full credit. Her name is Lindy Mesmer. She said to me, Dinah, I think you should train like an athlete and dance like an artist. Mm-hmm. So full credit to Lindy. Um, This is what we have. We have artistic athletes and in the athlete world. So I I also do sport. Um, I've been to three Olympic games and I've worked team Canada for uh, a really long time. And thank you. Uh, So we have sports that are more um, running, jumping. We have sports that are more combative and then we have sports that are more artistic Mm -hmm. so that's who those athletes are and our dancers are really artistic athletes it's just I had mentioned to Aaron earlier that dance Mm -hmm. doesn't have a governing body so in sport we have each sport has what's called a a national sport organization. And then within that national sport organization, you have what's called an IST or a integrated science team. And that's really the pit crew for that sport. So I would love before I die for dance to have a governing over body Mm -hmm. that can collect the protocols to help keep dancers safe and to really have that directory of pit crew people available for parents and participants. Yeah. I think it's the same here. Like here, every state kind of has its own rules when it comes to dance, but then that just makes it so confusing when teams like the ones I've been on and the ones that I've coached travel to Florida for nationals. Cause then it's like, you have to follow your state guideline, but those state guidelines are different in every state. Mm -hmm. And like we were talking about earlier, a little bit with that guideline, like there is no return to play just for dancers. Like there's a contact return to play, but I don't, my dancers don't tackle each other. I don't know about anyone else. (laughs) So it's like the return to play, which I know I've looked at your return to play concussion protocol for dancers specifically. Like that needs to be a procedure that is happening. Yeah. It's a standard. Yeah. Yeah. It's free and available on the pivot dancer Instagram, Uh, help yourself to it, print it out. It was accepted (laughs) by what's called parachute Canada. So we have a an association within Canada that their mission is to protect children. Yep. And they have a lot of position statements and they have all of the return to gymnastics, soccer, baseball, whatever it is, Mm post-concussion. And because we didn't have a governing body for dance, when we created that post-concussion return to dance protocol for ballet, jazz, and Irish, we submitted it to Parachute Canada and they accepted it. Nice. Yeah. Great job. That's awesome. Yeah. That's just awesome. And that's, and and that's really just on mission of, of what we're, you know, what we've been about too, is it's just like, and you, you said this more at the very beginning, this was the other thing I was going to touch on is we say this all the time. We have a, uh, an in-office talk we're doing tomorrow as well. So we've started, uh, we're, we're slow rolling out what's called the pure athlete. And it's wrapped around mental, physical, and relationships. And so this is going to be a whole nother resource for, uh, so I'm going to touch on two things here that'll wrap that in. But you said a lot of parents, this was before your your pit crew analogy, um, a lot of parents don't know where to go. Yeah. Like, what are the options? They don't know where to go, first of all. It's like, well, where do I go from here? They don't know what the options are, which hinders where the heck do I go? And they also, especially after the whole 2020 craze and whatever happened through that whole process, they don't know who they can trust. So those factors are the three that we talk about all the time. And mm-hmm. and I start my talks off. It's like, you know, how many parents here know where to go for certain injuries or know who they can trust, raise their hand and nobody raises their hand. So having things like you're doing um, as well to 
put out content, put out resources. Like you, you said the whole time resource. We've said that Mm -hmm. from, you know, last 18 months, we just want to be a resource. I don't care if we do business together. I don't care if we care for your child, but if we can be a resource, however, and point you to Dinah, point you to an ortho, point you to whatever it is you need, whoever it is on the pit crew, it creates loyalty, it creates trust, creates an eminent figure for the mission we have to protect children or protect student athletes that are and grow them better. Right. So it's just so far, it's just music to my ears from racing to intention to everything. Uh, <laughs> well, there I, I you just go. So, love this um, conversation. so the other thing that we did, well, I guess me, um, <laughs> I, I gathered some people to be a we, uh, yeah. but really what I wanted with Pivot Dancer is I wanted to have something that was truly accessible. Mm-hmm again, you know, geography, rock in the middle of the ocean, but also cost. I grew up with, you know, my, my dad would barter services for the studio so that I could, you know, attend dancing. He was putting up mirrors and bars and my mom was sewing costumes and we did a lot of that. And I, I don't know what the pricing is like for you in St. Louis, but in Canada to see me individually you have to come see me and it costs 150 canadian dollars which is probably about 62 cents in the u.s but it's <laughs> um it, it's not it's not a small amount of money and um it, certainly if somebody needed to come for multiple sessions and have multiple things dealt with it can add up pretty quickly mm-hmm. so one one of the things i really wanted was to create a program that people could not only access but access affordably and by putting together this collection of video resources there's over 450 videos now mm. and that's um it breaks down to about $12 and 50 cents a month it's 150 a year to access that which is less than i spend for my netflix membership yeah it, you know yeah. Uh, yeah, so you can obviously add more to that, but at least it gives something for people, you know, and if you're smart, like Aaron and scroll the internet and find the video section, you know, you can find a lot of complimentary information. I think the hard part, like you said, Dustin is navigating what's smart and what's potentially harmful yeah. because with social media and the internet there's everything there's no rules it's the wild wild you know place um so that part i think is really hard you know when i navigate it i have a hard time sometimes figuring out who people are you know are they trustworthy like you said who can i trust that may look really glitzy and cool and have a lot of followers but you know, I look at some things and I'm terrified because I know the science and I see something that's harmful and small children, you know, doing things that they really are not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. So navigating it, I think is really challenging. I don't know how to tell people, Hey, this is a really smart resource. Other Mm -hmm. than saying, hey, this is a really smart resource. Mm -hmm. And by having more and more conversations to help people navigate, if you have ideas on that, I would love to hear them. (laughs) Well, I think that's something that that we too are navigating and and, and vetting. And and that's why, you know, that's why Erica and I have also gathered a a we scenario. And that's why Aaron is our FBI (laughs) agent scrolling, vetting kind of person, um, because it's so true. And, and, And that's why even when I started this conversation, you know, popping off this episode was, you know, having people really across the world that can be resources. Um, there's, you know, there, I think there's so many untapped people um, that, that have so much good that they can do that they're, they don't know how to get it out there. So um, thank you for putting your stuff online and, and being a great resource and, and a credible resource, because much like you've probably done for us, you know, we vetted you on the, on the back end before this ever happened. And it's, it's, it's a mission that I think more people are looking for. And I can, 
you know, I can think of a couple ways with the clientele we see and the resources that you have that there could be potential for us to continue to collaborate mm-hmm. going forward. And, and, you know, we, we never want, I don't think there's any podcast that we've done that we haven't stayed in connection with the people yeah. um, because that's, that's true. Genuinely our relationships are, are what we want the most because we don't claim to know everything. And we know there's going to be things that, you know, we hope to be able to reach out to you for be like, Hey, have you seen this? Or what do you think of this? Or have you dealt with this, you know, and again, bring each other up to speed. So if I figure out how to go about that, (laughs) I will sure share that with you for sure. Um, But I think honestly, call me biased. I think we're all on the right page of doing what we're doing to be able to create that. I think it's still so new because of the wild, wild cloud that it is. Um, I think we can just keep doing what we're doing and collaborating more. And, you know, our little podcast doing stuff like this creates credibility and loyalty and people can vet us through the channels that we have already. And I think if we can have about 36 more hours in one single day and be able to do this this kind of stuff more, I think more people will get it, get it sooner. Um, but our, you know, a lot of things that we're doing is, is intentionally trying to capture the parents and the student athletes at this point, um, to do the evaluations, to be the resource, to answer the questions. And, you know, our ultimate athlete evaluation that we've done, you know, we can share even off the air, some of the things that we're doing with you, um, we'd be more than happy to do that. Um, because it's kind of like, uh, I don't know how it is in Canada. I have, I've yet to be there. I've been close. I did my residency actually just South of Albany, New York. So, uh, one of my biggest regrets was not going to a blues game in Montreal, which was like four hours away. And my buddy bailed and I decided not to go, but, um, but in it, there's, um, now where was I going with that? I just threw myself <laughs> off. Um, do you remember where I was going with that? Mm-hmm. I just had a brain fart. Um, well, shoot. Oh, sharing our research. That's okay. It'll come back to you it as soon as you stop thinking about regret of not visiting Canada. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no doubt. Yeah. Um, gosh, darn, that was a bummer. I was headed somewhere with that. It happens a lot. They're used to it. That's okay. Well, what, what else do you think your listenership would be like really interested in knowing? You know, I think it's more just the validation that we're all speaking the same thing. I, I, I think everything that you have said, if people that are listening to this have heard us speak, they're going to be like, huh. They're not the only one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, you're definitely not the only one. Yeah. It's um cool. I think it's fabulous. I, I think the dance science community got stuck at home during COVID and they all did research. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I I rehabbed a professional dancer who tore his Achilles in Mexico. I've never met him. He's delightful. I've seen him online about three hundred <laughs> times. Yeah. Um and I I didn't have the the resources to say sure I'll you know virtually work with you one on one every day but I had the resources to say hey why don't you just come join our strength classes, and he was doing so well in his rehab I thought you know what we should take some measurements, so we did and we actually presented his case at the International Association of Dance Medicine and Science and the Performing Arts Medicine Association meetings because. He turned out better after his Achilles tear and repair than your science spoken NCAA athlete. Mm. And I I still haven't met him. I I need to go to Mexico at some point to meet him. Uh, But I thought, you know, that's fascinating. Like we can really do amazing things. And the dance science community has really come out in force to say, hey, you know what? The world is not flat. It is round. And we can work together, not in silos. And we have really important things to offer dancers who are doing crazy choreography now, yeah. who are doing crazy cheerleading now, who are doing crazy, like the the bar has been raised. Right. And if we expect our performers to do raised skills, we as a healthcare community need to support them along that journey. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. I'm back. I got it. My regret of not visiting Canada is over. Here we go. You just tied it back into it. So I don't know what it's like in Canada, but here, and you just said it, there's on every corner, like every block, there's like 
call block a square on every corner of that block. There's a CVS, a Walgreens, a pharmacy of some sort. So there's a lot of awareness of they just see that all the time. All they do is see that. That's where I need to go to get my stuff, my things, my this, my that. So my thought was, is it's like you asked, what do what do our viewership need to know? I think they just need to keep hearing this because if they keep hearing this, like they see the pharmacies on every corner, it's going to become the new standard. It's going to become the the awareness of like, well, hang on a second. Why do I keep seeing the, all of these all over the place? I might need to walk in there. I might need to do my research. I might need to vet them because I see, or at least see the conversation that we're having. Maybe it's not vital performance or pivot dancer, but they start to realize the likeness of there's so many com. Well, I wouldn't say there's so many companies. I think we're really on the front end of this, but there's, there's, there's entities like ours that would just need to be more awareness of. So just keeping, keeping the focus on seeing this over and over again, the repetition of seeing like, this conversation and hearing this content, I think is really the biggest thing. And then all of a sudden it's going to be like, it'll be a nice shift away from some of the, there's a time and place for the Western science, the critical healthcare. But I think everybody's looking for the shift to be like, where can I go first? Yeah. And if they keep seeing stuff like this, they're going to act on it. Yeah. And like, when you talk about him rehabbing better than he was before, like, that's why I was like, Hmm, because so many people think like, there is a textbook way to rehab. We all learn the protocols, like memorize them right now, mm-hmm. tell you them right now of what it is to return someone to sport after an ACL injury, an MCL, like any of that situation. However, that's rehabbing them back to a person who can just walk around and go to Costco if they want to. There's a difference between rehabbing that person who's just going to go grocery shopping and an artistic athlete or an NCAA athlete. Yeah. And that's what we're running into right now is like people come and they are rehabbed back to their range of motion is normal. However, they're not performing the way they did before. So no, they're not clear. They're not rehabbed correctly. Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I'm a little different because I have had my career in high performance and activity. So regardless of whether, you know, your activity is grocery shopping, I want you to, you know, pivot on out of here (laughs) far better than you came in it's not about rehabbing the injury um and i do have the advantage of not being within the hospital system the hospital system really has huge space and financial constraints on what they can do so when you when your injury has recovered to functional Mm -hmm. status that's when you're discharged Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm working in the community in um, what we call a private system uh, so people can use extended health benefits or they can pay out of pocket. It's not covered by our national health care mm-hmm. bucket. Um, you can go as far as you want. And as a patient, you can recover to functional or you have the option of recovering, you know, past that. Uh, and I always offer people the opportunity to recover past that. And I mean, I find even in our work, when I graduated, uh, you know, when the dinosaurs were alive, um, (laughs) we, uh, we, we had, it was much more of a come, why don't you sit on this bed and I will do something to you and then you will leave this bed. Mm. And, and there's still parts of that that are really important. But what I find now is that there's been a big shift in my profession to really look at, great, what do you need to do that's off the bed? Because yep. you're never on this bed in functional living and you have to not only go to Costco and run your house, but hey, if you're an athlete or a performer, you know, your, your instrument is your body. Yep. So what else can we do to support you to be better at what you do and along the road prevent you from having this or something else mm-hmm. happen to you? Yeah, 100%. Like, I don't, I don't care if you're sprinting up and down a basketball court or you're running through an airport. Like, same thing. yeah, you can walk across the airport. Well, yeah, that's great. But would you like the opportunity to be able to make your flight across the entire terminal when you only have 22 minutes to get there? (laughs) 
like let's rehab you to that. Yeah. I mean, let's, let's increase the performance. Like you're not a bag of symptoms. You're a person who has a life to live. And if you can walk, that's great, but you're going to miss all your flights. So I don't like, what are we going to go from here? So no, that's good. What is, uh, so when we've probably already been talking about it, but let me reverse the question here. Yeah. Um, what, what is it that you want people to know about you from your perspective, from pivot dancer? Like what, if this, this platform up in it is wide open for you, what do you want to get through to the world, to our community about why you do what you do and why it's important? Yeah, I would love to tell your listeners that they have options and they have smart options out there that are affordable uh, and accessible. So for anybody who wants the opportunity to excel, you know, anybody who wants to do something a little bit better, have a little edge, ultimately it is their choice. Mm -hmm. There is no magic wand. There is no magic, you know, thing you can eat or take. Mm -hmm. Uh, It really is somebody's choice. And then putting in the work and the effort and work to me has a connotation of it's hard and it's boring and it's not fun. I can tell you that work can be flipping fun. Mm -hmm. You know, doing a deadlift is so cool when you've never done it before. And all of a sudden you can lift a weight and you feel good about it. And then you realize that you can jump higher. Like (laughs) that is fun. Yeah. Um, and there are there are ways that are fun, affordable, accessible. Pivot Dancer is one of those ways. So, yeah. you know, know that there are the tools there for you. It doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter where you come from. People like you and like me are here to support that community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. With proper resources. <laughs> With not not so much the jaw clenching, nervous yeah. eye twitch. Yeah, that's yeah. Good. If you're doing something and it doesn't feel, you know, right, or you're in pain, this is probably a good time to reevaluate. Right. Yep. Or if it was a a single a single bullet scenario, if you're being sold a, a single answer cure all, so to speak reevaluate right you know it, there's there's more to that but i agree it can be a lot of fun and you know the the perspective and how you're spoken to on that throughout the whether it's rehabilitation process or um physical training you know performance training process whatever it is you know being finding people that are going to uplift you and if they start the conversation well this is going to be hard and you're going to be sore well nah, we need to find somebody else <laughs> it's like hey this is going to be great we're going to get you here it's all about the outcome it's all about what you're training for it's not a cost it's an investment and while there is affordability you get and like you said you get to choose like something you want to invest in yeah. is it the cheapest thing you're ever going to do no probably not is it the most expensive thing you're ever going to do no probably not but it's an investment not a cost it's a lifestyle and if you want to partake you have the choice to do that with the resources that you have and that we have and that we're going to be able to continue to network with and and provide around the globe i mean shoot i mean training with team Canada is no joke people. That's That's a big, big deal. Um, honestly, I didn't know that. So now I'm like over here, like, Ooh, I got some work to do. (laughs) I got some work to do here. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And I, I love like taking my, my dancers and usually if, whether it's virtual space or whether it's in-person space, I will take my professional dancers, my student dancers, and I'll take my soccer players and my rugby players um, and I put them in together. Yeah. I do that intentionally. It's like my maniacal little you know, plan to <laughs> join everybody together. Uh, we just did this really great project in the summertime where one of our performers um, was Tarzan. He was cast as Tarzan. And he called me and he's like, so I have 14 weeks to prepare to be Tarzan, which means I have to run around the stage in a loincloth, look good in it, and not get injured for two weeks of rehearsal and three weeks of shows. Right. So how do I do that? And I ended up calling a rugby coach, and I put him together a, a rugby training program with the, the physio and the nutritional support. 
And uh, you can check out his photos on the Bivet Dancer Instagram. It is crazy. We added five inches to his shoulder girdle oh, in wow. 14 weeks without steroids, without a magic pill, without, you know, being unhealthy. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's like he's a poster child for this is what you can do if you choose to do it. And I costed it out in the time of the professionals that was given to him in one-on-one -on -one and follow through sessions would have been approximately $900 Canadian which again is a lot less us but it that's the thing it it is available for people you simply have to choose yeah, yeah that's awesome no oh, that's so good um well i think before we get on a, another passionate topic um if you're not opposed we could probably do a part two and three and really hone in. I've been picking up things and because I think, you know, us seeing a lot of football players and a lot of college athletes too, it's just like, Oh, we got to put on weight, got to put on weight or dancers got to cut weight, got to cut weight. And it becomes a very unhealthy conversation and, or an unhealthy execution yeah. in that category. Yeah. And so that's something we can talk on and, and we can kind of dive in and niche down into some, some conversations too. Um, but well, let's do a vital series. Yeah. There it is. In. We can do that. Absolutely. It's a we can do pivotal that. and vital. There we go. Yep. <laughs> yeah. See, now we are working. Um, yeah, I'd love to. I love that you brought that up. So obviously that is a yes. Um, but I think we're gonna leave this one as a little bit of a, a teaser. I think there's some great content in here anyway. Um, I'm excited to continue to look through your content. Um, so for is so is it pivotal dancer on Instagram? So Pivot Dancer is the Instagram. Uh, it's a very open book. You're more than welcome to check out, you know, Pivot Sport Medicine, Dinah Hampson. Um, you'll see lots of cooking on mine. <laughs> I am not a natural public speaker, believe it or not. I am very shy. I was a nerd. I had no friends. Wow. I did not like speaking with people. And when I figured out that I had to in COVID, I created a fake cooking show called Someone's in the Kitchen with Dinah so that I could cook on the internet and learn how to speak that to other so humans. Iconic. I love that. that is so but good. for your audience, I think Pivot Dancer is going to be the most fun. So go I don't know, we're in the there. Midwest. We like to cook. <laughs> that is fair. Uh, yeah, it's it's a fun place to be. It's a really fun community. And one of the other things that came out of that work that I did with the dancer in Mexico was he said to me, you know, it wasn't just the physical value of returning to dance and having my physical return. It was the support that I received from the virtual community of dancers and teachers who mm -hmm. gave me a reason to show up. And I had never thought that that was achievable or that it was that important. And I don't know why I didn't know that, uh, but that struck me. And I think our world will simply be a better place yeah. when people embrace each other in a safe and supportive way. Well, I would, uh, uh, a, a non, I'm like un, unshamed here. I hope you can also connect with us and follow the pure athlete as we continue to roll this out. Mm -hmm. Um, because I know we're going to have more conversations. The pure athlete is rolling out and it's, it's great that you say that. And I was pointing to my hat, my head the whole time, but I told you the three pillars are mental, physical, and relationship and to rehab prehab, like prehab before rehab, ideally. Right. Um, but because of the, it was like you said, when he said, it's not so much about getting back to sport, it was the community. And there's a whole mental side of being taken out of your sport because of an injury. There's a whole mental side of knowing that you need to perform better, but don't know what the resources are to get better, get stronger, grow five inches. That becomes a huge mental game. And one of my biggest heartbeats is I'm sick of seeing student athletes jump out of windows and overdose on things because they can't hack it yeah. or they don't have the resources. So, and I think that's in our talks. I think that's changed a lot of parents, um, even for dancers. It's like, look, I don't care that she has a torn labrum. 
I care that we rehab it correctly to get her back to doing what she wants and loves to do because it's here that's going to hurt. And it, if you lose your head, you lose your heart. It's like, what am I living for? Now we have a whole different conversation that we have to battle. So there's so much more to what you're doing and realizing, you know, people need to realize it's like, you're not a walking bag of symptoms. It's that you have things you want, need and love to do that we want to get you back to because there's a whole mental aspect to this that you deserve to enjoy and not have to deal with. So that's super cool. I'm glad you that's I'm, awesome. You that. Yeah. Okay. To close it, close it down. I had so much fun being here. Otherwise I, I'm going to talk to you all afternoon, but I yeah. would love to talk to your listeners again. So we'll sure. figure that out. All right. Well, there you go. Pivot dancer on Instagram. Um, we've rolled in the pure athlete with that as well. Dinah, thank you so much for being with us. I'm excited to, to talk more. I think we're, we're totally on mission here. Um, have a great rest of your day. Hope you guys enjoyed. See ya.